was supposed to be up here? Are you going to introduce me? Yes, exactly. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to this presentation, especially later in the day when other people are starting to drift off to get food and various things. I'm Jason Scott. I'm running Block Party, and Block Party, as part of its events, I have brought in a handful of speakers to uh, not a con, to present on various subjects interested to art, demo scene, and so on. And one of the people who I approached was this gentleman, Ed Pisker, who has created a comic book called WYSIWYG, which is a, as I put it, a stew, a remixed telling of a lot of hacker history, giving it from a different perspective and not getting hung up so much on specific names, specific facts, but giving a really nice feel of the zeitgeist of the last 30 years of hacking history. So I thought it was kind of interesting that an artist, especially someone with his pedigree who has worked with American Splendor and a number of other professional projects, dedicated him so much as an outsider to a technical subject. So you have a comic book that's trying to look at an extremely technical history and presenting it. And I just thought, wow, that's a real good combination of art and technology from the other end. So I figured, hey, let's invite him in and have him talk a little bit about his experience and whatever else. Uh, comes to his mind. So I give to you Ed Pisker. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. Um, before I really get into the talk, I do have a confession to make. Um, I am sort of a Luddite. I'm a technical neophyte. I, I've never seen an iPhone in real life. I know they exist. They must. But I, uh, technology, to be frank, sort of intimidates me. And it's, it's, it's very complicated. But uh, to, to do this, this, this comic book about hacking, I'd like to just, just bring up a few sort of, sort of uh, points as to, as to how I became acquainted with uh, computer hacking, phone freaking, and uh, high technology. Um, as a kid, I was born in uh, Homestead, Pennsylvania, which is predominantly a mill town. And when uh, I was born, my parents have worked in the mills. Uh, my mother worked there over a decade. My dad worked, the, worked there almost uh, 25 years. And a few months after I was born, the mill was closed. Uh, so Moore's Law wasn't at a point where uh, I'd be able to uh, have a computer in the household for another a decade and a half or so. Um, I asked for one every year. I was always interested in the idea of playing around with computers and I would see them at, at uh, uh, my cousin's house and just it, it seemed like such arcane uh, magic to me and it was interesting but it was always always elusive and it just wasn't a possibility uh, for me as a kid at the time. Um, The, the thing that I did have at my disposal uh, all of my life was pencils and paper uh, that, that, you know, was in abundance in our household. And so I started to, to just draw, and I was always into comic books. And the, the magic behind uh, what would happen in a comic book page uh, was extremely fascinating to me, the idea that something could be happening in this frame, a person could be, say, laying in bed, and in the next frame they could be uh, driving in a car, and there's that space in between the panels where all this information sort of takes place, all this sort of subtext and story is going on, but you put that together in your head, and that just seemed like, like a, a very interesting way to tell a story. Uh, if I was more of a team player or if I, you know, played well with others, I suppose I would have went into maybe like filmmaking or something like that. But the point is I, I do uh, appreciate my solitude and I also appreciate telling stories. So comic, uh, comic books were the proper way uh, that I could get this, this need uh, across. You know, I didn't need anybody to, to uh, help me in that process. So that was something that uh, really, really attracted me as a kid, and I've I've worked uh, at it my entire life. Went to went to art school for comic books specifically. There were a couple uh, uh, comic book related higher education courses, and I certainly took those. But then I, I quickly realized that I was dropping a lot of cash to do this, 
and uh, you know, it's not like med the medical field or something like that. I wasn't going to become a doctor and make, make a bunch of loot to pay back all of this debt that I was accruing. So I quit that uh, after a year and decided to try to learn the technical aspects of cartooning and illustrating uh, and getting paid for it, trying to figure out how I could do that. So I started putting the work in front of the uh, eyes of different editors, comic book editors, um, editors of the, uh, free weekly papers all over the country and uh, started getting some some nibbles and bites and ultimately broke into comics by uh, having uh, Harvey Picard, he's a, he's a Cleveland local guy who does uh, American Splendor. Um, he saw my comics and this is right after the American Splendor movie was out, Paul Giamatti played in like 2003 and me and my buddy, we went to go see this flick and Harvey has a very particular speech pattern and voice, which is very gruff, grouchy. In fact, before the movie, uh, there was a stage play, and the guy who played Picar was uh, Dan Castellaneta, the voice of Homer Simpson. And whenever he would speak, uh, it, 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 he sounded like Krusty the Clown on stage. Um, so I got this call after sending submissions to different companies and getting rejected, you know, day after day, the rejection letters were just coming in. And I get this call one day, and uh, it's, it's, he says he's Harvey. He's like, hey, Ed, I, I love your comics. I, I wonder if you want to draw something for me. Now, I went to see this movie with my buddy, and I thought he was playing such a vicious joke on me. I thought he was, he was uh, just mimicking this guy's voice. And I said, knock it off, man. Quit playing around. It turned out it was Harvey. And he was interested in working with me. So I did like a four-page comic book for him, a four-page strip, I should say, in a, in a, in a uh, graphic novel. And he, he dug that work and gave me like a 24-page strip to do. I had very little time to do it. And I got it done. I had to sort of postpone my, my birthday party and stuff like that to get it done. But we got it done. And that sort of, um, I, I, I sort of, prove myself to the guy that I could reliably get some work done uh, in a quick amount of time whenever he needed it. And he gave me a, an entire graphic novel to draw, uh, like a 150-page story. Now, when I, when I uh, set to work on this story, it was, it's a book called Macedonia about the geopolitical sort of destabilization in, uh, in Macedonia and the Balkan region. They have all the ingredients for there to be. Uh, a, a pretty terrible war, but they've, they've averted that. They, they were able to prevent that, any war there up to this point and, you know, with a, with a sort of Albanian minority that is pretty close to the majority and a lot of Christians. It, 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 it's a bad situation there. Anyhow, um, to produce a page of comics, um, you know, you see them, they're a pretty small size, usually six by nine or the, the uh, size of graphic novels. But when you draw these things, each page is about double that size, so around 11 by 17 inches. Uh, it takes a lot of pencil mileage, as they call it. Um, it takes maybe two to three days to draw a, a reasonable page of comics. It's a lot of time, and you, your, your other senses are kind of in need of entertainment. It's hard to keep your butt in a chair um, if you don't have something going for you, listening to good music or, or uh, what have you. And I was tired of the tunes that I, that I had on CD. I memorized every sort of audio commentary track uh, on every DVD that I had. So I uh, started to look on the internet for different content. And I came across just one of these podcast aggregation sites where uh, everything is denoted with tags and stuff like that. And I saw the show Off the Hook, uh, with, and then the tag uh, associated with it was, was hacking. And um, being a Luddite, not knowing about 2600 Magazine at the time, I thought that it was going to be a really cool podcast about how to do some vicious, evil, vile, terrible things. And I listened to like a newer, a newer one at the time. And it was this, this interesting political uh, conversation. And just the, the sentence that, that uh, I've always remembered is 
well, they're, they're, to, paraphrase, to paraphrase, they were talking about how uh, we live in a republic that passes itself off as a democracy. And it wasn't exactly what I, what I thought you know, the subject matter was going to contain. And for whatever reason, I decided to just start at the beginning. And I listened to the entire archive of uh, the Off the Hook radio show, um, found at 2600.com, uh, beginning, beginning in 88, but pretty much starting regularly in 89. And I just became absolutely obsessed with the show. I listened to maybe eight or nine of these a day for months. And because as I was producing the, the, the Macedonia graphic novel, that took about 14 months of steady drawing, like seven days a week. And this show completely enthralled me. It uh, was extremely entertaining. I couldn't wait, wait to wake up and go downstairs and work because I was extremely interested. You guys are laughing. But the, uh, the, the, the sort of history that's involved with this show, um, Emanuel Goldstein's unique position as being the publisher of 2600 Magazine sort of gave him like a front row center seat in the, the development of high technology and um, he was on the front lines of, of just where hacking was going and in the abysmal treatment of hackers and just people involved with, with technology when we had a government and still do have a government that does, doesn't quite know how to legislate this stuff uh, and um, it was just it was just a fascinating show and there were if you listen to the archive there are these long uh, sort of sprawling epic dramas that take place that uh, that are really meaningful and, and I think important 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 uh, just just um, aspects of the hack, ha you know, hacking culture and, and um, technology in general. Uh, for instance, if you remember the, the, the amateur action BBS and how that was, that was taken offline, the, the, the people who ran it were at least threatened with lawsuits. I'm not, I'm not sure if they were put in jail. But the idea that you could like, run a BBS in California and because some, somebody checks it out in Kansas, B be charged with, uh, you could be charged with interstate porn trafficking or something like that. It was just kind of ridiculous. Um, throughout the show, we, get to, we got to know guys like, like Bernie S, Fiber Optic, and over the years, they would be regular guests on this show. You would get to know them as much as they would let you get to know them. And they seemed very interesting, extremely smart. And then these bombshells would drop where you know, so-and-so got pinched by the cops, so-and-so got raided, they got their house raided, and guns put in the face of their kid sisters and stuff like that, and it was just, it, 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 you, you get such a feel for these guys that um, it evoked physical emotion in me as I was sitting there listening to this stuff. So when, when Bernie got put in, in jail, it, it, I, I sort of shed a tear for the guy when, when fiber optic, he, he was in the studio like a day or two before he was heading off to prison. It was extremely sad to me. And uh, the, the day he got out, when Emmanuel played Rude Boys Out of Jail by the specials, I, I cried like a little baby to an extent. And so uh, the point is that the show, it, it was so meaningful. And there were these really human, kind of beautiful stories that were taking place on the show. It just... Um, it was extremely fascinating to me. Um, Emmanuel would also talk to various authors on the show. Um, Stephen Levy, John Markoff, uh, Joshua, Joshua Quitner, Jonathan Littman. Whenever they, would, whenever they would have a book coming out um, that would either deal with, you know, Mitnick, Polson, Masters of the Deception, what have you. And that gave me a point to, a point of reference to dig deeper into this culture that, that really started becoming extremely fascinating to me. And uh, at the library, just uh, every single one of those books was available. Uh, I certainly did not take those for gospel because the, with the value of the show is you could get a lot of 
uh, the true information from the horse's mouth, so to speak. But uh, the value of those books is that they kind of gave me a little further analysis psychologically into the mindset of these, these individuals. And I felt that a lot of their motivations were, were very similar. They, if, if you were to create like a psychological portrait of these guys, it wouldn't be very different. And uh, I can also, they, they had sort of an, a, a type A obsessive quality to them that I would, um, I, I also see that same quality in a lot of my friends who are cartoonists. And uh, I just thought that uh, if, I, if I was to, I just identified with it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, certainly not the, the exact specifics of hacking and stuff like that. I, I believe that, that a lot of artists and hackers have very, very similar uh, psychological profiles. It's just the, the energy is split a little bit differently. The, the, the way we choose to express ourselves is, is uh, different. And um, a lot of, since these individuals like Mitnick, Polson, uh, in my opinion, have a lot of similar traits, I thought it would be interesting to maybe like tell a fictional story in which um, all of these crazy things that these guys sort of got involved with, um, what, what if one character experienced all of, all of this madness? And that was the, the basic impetus of this story I, was t I decided that I wanted to tell. I, I, I think that um, as, a, as a cartoonist, I'm kind of the, the best cartoonist for the job. Not a lot of other guys who draw comics know about this sort of thing. And for better or worse, um, I decided to give it a shot. So that basically was the major inspiration for uh, this comic that I'm working on. And um, right now I have two volumes, two volumes uh, finished. It takes a lot of time to do these comics. Um, the first volume deals, uh, deals almost exclusively with phone freaking. Um, so there, there are sort of homages to Steve Jobs and Wozniak and Captain Crunch to an extent. And a lot of stuff that they did at that, at that time. Second volume deals a lot more with uh, computer hacking. And the third volume that's going to be coming out soon is um, going to focus a lot on the, the law aspect. And the, the, characters are, uh, the, character, the main character is going to be sort of a fugitive from the law. So we're going to, I'm going to sort of explore some of the things that uh, Mitnick and Polson did uh, to sort of uh, kind of keep hidden or whatnot. Um, let me see here. Um, one of the main reasons that I decided to, to uh, do, I, I'm self-publishing this book. Um, I am an established cartoonist, and it's possible to, to have another comics book, comic book publisher put the work out, but it would require a lot of editorial interference and a lot of changes would have to be made. Um, unfortunately, the, the mainstream point of view still, um, still sort of um, demonizes hackers and the, the, the point of view that I'm trying to get across isn't exactly a popular one or for their purposes particularly interesting. Unfortunately, they, they would uh, I had this one editor tell me that there weren't enough ex explosions, and there wasn't, uh, you know, the, the the too many phone conversations in the phone freaking episodes of the, of the, uh, of the story. So, just self-publishing the stuff. Um, the, I really didn't have much of an idea of how it would be responded to in the high technology, computer hacking. Uh, sort of uh, demographic or whatever. It was just going to be a comic book story that I was going to peddle to my comic book drawing friends and people who knew me from American Splendor. And um, 
I had a friend who's on the, the, the BinRev forum, and I decided to kind of, to be honest, spam and like let these people know that the comic existed, and it was, it was uh, responded to with, with open arms. They, the, the people there really dug it. Um, Jason Scott discovered it from Kizzle, who's a, who's a member on, on that board, and he grabbed a few copies. He wrote a really nice review about it once he got these copies. Other people started getting them and writing about it. Um, there were articles in like Boing Boing and uh, the, out in Silicon Valley, there's like this entire landscape of technology pundits and critics and things like that. So there are all these IPTV shows coming out and other podcasts and things. And these guys started getting the comic and talking about it and other people started grabbing it. And it's actually, it's, it's doing pretty good. A lot of copies are being distributed. And uh, so it's, it's able to sort of facilitate itself and, and um, it's, I'm able to produce the next volumes because people are interested. So uh, it turned out to be a pretty good thing. And if you're interested, I brought a lot of the artwork. If, you, if you're into that sort of thing, you want to check, check that stuff out. Um, I have a table set up out there. And if you want to look through the comics, comics are out there too. So there you have it. Uh, I think I'm done. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, Bernie. Uh, they're, go they're going to be bringing you a microphone. You want to come up and ask? Is it working? Yes, yeah, working. Um, well, you mentioned you use off the hook uh, the radio show, and we're, we're you know we laughed when we heard that you listened to like like four hours of this a day for months. Probably like eight or nine, to be honest about it. Eight or nine hours a day for how many months? A whole like, day. I, I, yeah. It would it would like literally from morning until night. We laughed because we we can't stand to listen to ourselves, <laughs> <laughs> and we're amazed that anybody listens to it. But I, I, it, it, it's, it's a fantastic document for just technology in general, for, for the, the trials and tribulations of hackers. It's just fantastic. But uh, that can't have been your sole source of, uh, of uh, raw material. So um, what other sources inspired you and uh, provided you with uh, a sort of you know, other material to weave into your comics? I'm sort of glad you brought that up because that was a footnote here that I kind of like didn't even pay attention to um, out of nervousness. But um, on the show, you guys would, would mention just things in passing. Yipple slash Tap magazine. Um, you guys produced the, you know, 2600. So there's a, there's a really great PDF floating around of Yipple Tap that's like three or 400 pages. So I poured over that. Um, these, these other books that I spoke about, you know, Masters of Deception, I sort of, I sort of held those at a distance because they were a, you know, a writer's interpretation and, it, you know, just by virtue of going through the filter of some, some, you know, journalism major, like, you know, there certainly were inconsistencies, I'm sure. But um, I use those as a reference point, the Freedom Downtime flick. Uh, was was a really great sort of pl that that was really my introduction into into what uh, what a lot of the stuff you guys did was and um, you know another motivation was also like that movie Hackers and and uh, War Games and I sort of vowed not to go that far with the material I wanted to try to keep it. As, as cool and le like legitimate as possible without having to, to resort to any of the, the funky stuff that those, those sort of endeavors, uh, you know, participated in. But, th but that's a thing, that, that, that's a, you know, with, with these movies, that, that's a kind of communal thing and there's a lot of money involved and it has to be kind of lowest common denominator. And so that's why they put in like all the, uh, all the fluff that is, completely inaccurate. Um, but 
I, I do have an interest in technology, and I was aware of the Mitnick situation, and this gave me just uh, a, a uh, way, a really narrow beam to sort of focus on, and, and uh, that was, Off the Hook was a, the, the major influence in, in the project, to, to be honest about it. But there were these other things. They were all peripheral, though. Well, uh, thanks for using this as a source, but um, don't uh, don't believe that everything we say is true either. <laughs> I, I try not to take any any sort of didactic stances or anything like that. It, the with a little more research, the the stuff that you guys have gone through, it was pretty pretty accurate as far as I could tell. Hi there. Um, one thing that I one thing that I realized reading your book is. Um, well, while a hacker can read it and certainly pick out things that uh, you've taken from reality, of course it's fictionalized, but uh, there, are, there are callbacks here and there. But um, it's really good at evoking the sort of feeling behind things, you know, the general idea behind things, um, in a way that you don't have to already be of the hacker community to, to uh, get. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, if you've gotten any particular response outside the hacker geek communities um, to your book. Like, yeah, pretty favorable. Um, the, the, the most critical people are the people who are into technology and hacking, and, and, uh, but, but uh, comics fans, I, I haven't really gotten a bad criticism on the story yet, and the, the way that I'm telling the story, I would love to put some of the really technical stuff that, that I research into it, but I do want to keep it as entertaining as possible to a casual reader, as well as try to retain as much of, of the, the sort of guts of what hacking is and, and what um, some, of these, some of these players have, have been through. Um, but with the casual comics fans, they, they, they seem to dig it. Nobody, nobody really um, gave me much trouble or, or said that they hated it. It was pretty much, you know, there's a lot of... Um, the, the, the timeline of events in the story are a little bit skewed. I kind of like am, am just picking and choosing, and, and uh, some events happen before others, and that's just, uh, just, that's just so that I could tell a, the specific story that, that I have in my mind. Um, I, I may make note of these weird changes, uh, when, like usually in the, in the back of the, the first volume, I kind of point out all the funky stuff, but um, yeah, e everybody seems to be okay with it. Nobody's really given much much trouble or whatever, much criticism. Uh, is there any other questions or? Uh, this is actually kind of related to the last question. Um, you say you're non-technical, but I've found the more, as a non-technical person, the more you immerse yourself in this culture, and just by being married to someone who's very technical, right. the more you, even if you can't keep up with them, um, you start to pick up the language and, and the culture. Um, and I've found the problem when I'm trying to write accounts of, of hacker events that people who have no contact with this culture or aren't, aren't related to subcultures in general, they get lost and they don't, they, they just have no idea what I'm talking about. So I was wondering what steps you took and how you put a control on that. Um, I, I, I do have an interest in technology. It, I, I find it very cool. It's just up front whenever I, you know, talk about this. Um, I, I need to just let everybody know that I am not I've never coded anything. I've, I don't know how to write a program or to save my life. I don't even know how to write HTML, to be honest. Um, but, but I do have an interest in it. And um, I, I, I have a certain landscape of knowledge that, that can, can get me by. But um, just in terms of the story, I, I figured if, if there were too many, if I could just intuitively get a feeling if um, it was going, the, 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 if the destination that I was going to was a little bit kludgy in terms of 
technical terms and and very complicated stuff. If I had to, if I had to do a lot of research to write a page um, just on technical stuff, it, it was probably a good time to simplify things and and kind of just try to get the the main point across without without showing or in, in including a lot of that real uh, technical jargon and things. Um, is there anything else? Um, two things. First, I love the Public Enemy shirt, but coupled with the Pittsburgh Pirate hat, I really like you. Um, it's, it's killer. Um, number two, and I don't want to take too much time on this, so I mean, if it can be condensed, awesome, but if not, I'll hit you up after the panel. But could you go through a little bit of the self-publishing like mechanics, like from, from ink on paper to published, stapled, out on newsstands type of things for those of us who are kind of interested in that too. Cool. Um, so you're interested in even the, the technical aspects of producing a, yeah. a page of comics, like by drawing it? Yeah, well, I mean, insofar as it's interesting to everyone else, yeah. Um, and I, I, I could listen to you do it for hours and hours because I'm really, really deep into it. I've read, like, the Cerebus Guide to Self-Publishing, and I have a tremendous number of friends who are in comics but through publishers. And from the point they turn in their scripts or they turn in their, their finished pages to the point it actually becomes a comic book, um, there's that nether legend of, you know, what it cost, how you got it done, you know, how did you ship it, what arrangements did you make that I'm, I'm actually really interested in, but, you know, on a general scale, how did you go about doing it? Okay, so, uh, so because of the editorial aspect of getting it published, I did decide to go it alone, and when I constructed the story, um, I wanted to make each, it was always going to be f four parts, which I have to pr produce right now, I'm still working on a couple, um, to, to sort of tackle in one book a very specific part of this story that I was trying to tell. Um, right now, graphic novels are, as they call them, are pretty hip. and. Uh, you know, they're interesting to people. People who wouldn't normally read comics are, uh, it, it's sort of graphic novels, the, the, the book sort of dimensions and, and aspect of it kind of legitimize it so that, you know, very stuffy people can get away with reading the stuff. So the, before putting pen to paper, um, I, had this in mind and knew that it was going to have to be four substantial volumes. Um, I'm, this, this is a project that I believe in more than any other stuff that I'm working on, but it is a side gig because it is a self-published effort. I, I do comics professionally um, for publishers and stuff like that, so, so um, this was a side project and it took a very long time to produce these first two volumes. Um, on a whim, kind of, uh, I didn't know what to ask for for Christmas this one, this one year, and I got a quote from a print-on-demand service that um, gave me a pretty good quote if I got like a certain number of them. And so I asked my girlfriend if she would pony up the cash for that, and she did, and um, so that, that provided the first batch of books. And, you know, I continue to use print on demand. So it's a mistake if you're going, if you're thinking about just the way the economy and comics in particular, um, it, it would be a mistake to print like thousands of these things. But I, I have sold thousands of them, but in very small doses. Like I would never suggest getting a ton of these things printed. Maybe um, usually you get a pretty good discount if you get maybe 100 at a time. And so that's what I did. I would get a hundred and send a couple to different like comic book uh, 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 bloggers and interviewers and stuff like that. And you know, I, I spammed the bin rev for them. And then and then th that's how the it sort of migrated to uh, the the technology community and. It's, it, so, so that, I think that's an important part of it. If, if you have, if you produce a, uh, a work that 
can fill a niche or has a particular audience, it would probably be a good idea to make sure that, that they see it or, uh, you know, if, if there are respected individuals in that field, make sure you send a, a couple of copies to, you know, around to various people. I wouldn't bug them to, to write something about it, but maybe they will and it'll interest other people who like the project, who, who might decide to give the, the project a chance. And um, for me, it just, it just went from there. I mean, it's not, it's not huge or anything like that, but it's, it's able to sustain itself and, um, you know, it creates like a nice little secondary little expendable income or whatever. Um, is there anything else? Okay. Is uh, that me? No. Oh, okay. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you know, hackers in the hacker community, they, among, uh, you know, people outside, outsiders, you know, ordinary humans, they, they, uh, have you ever encountered uh, the fear that those people have? Has it ever been, like, directed at you? Or, like, why, why are you glorifying these criminals? Have you ever had that kind of, like, you know, proletariat reaction to? My, uh, one of my aunts is, is an executive at, at the uh, Pittsburgh branch of, I guess, Ver Verizon now. <laughs> and uh, and she, she's like, oh, you better be careful. You better be careful talking about that sort of thing. You, the government might come after. She's just like, you know, towing the company line. And uh, so she's the only one that kind of broke my balls about it. But um, other than that, not really. Like, but, but the preconceived notions that people have about the book, they think that it probably contains maybe um, subversive information or um, I glorify like bad things and that's just, that just ain't true. Um, anything else? Well, all right. Bernie? In your uh, third, third volume, are you, are you carrying uh, any characters over uh, between volumes? Carrying characters over? Car carrying characters over from one to the other. Um, it would be interesting to hear what you're saying about, uh, you know, you introducing new characters, you killing off any characters, <laughs> that sort of thing. The, the, the story is really like the life and times of this one particular character. So, um, you know, I was really interested in, in the, the fugitive aspect and what, what Mitnick and Polson were sort of able to do to s keep one step ahead of whoever was looking, after, looking for them. So that's, that's what this third volume is, is focusing on, just kind of how, how, to, uh, how they sort of were able to disappear for a while and obtain new identities with, with the, you know, the Social Security Death Index stuff. And uh, so it's, it's one character is sort of the MacGuffin uh, that is used to visit these different like periods in hacking culture. And, and the fourth volume is going to deal with um, life in jail for a hacker. Which you, the fourth one, yeah. Uh, anything else? Well, all right. Thank you.